The reading today is from John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14. In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognise him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home amongst us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Well, listen, folks, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'd hoped that I was going to be speaking to you in person. Uh, if nothing else, simply to thank you for your kindness, for your welcome to Rachel and I. We came here in January. And I was out speaking for quite a lot of the time, so I wasn't able to get to know you folks. But you've been very kind to us, very welcoming, and I want to thank in particular our Digging Deeper group. We feel that we've really got to know them well. So um, hello, you guys on Digging Deeper. Thank you for your kindness, and we look forward to next time we see you. Thank you, Christine, for, it, for reading that passage to us. It is a wonderful passage. It's already been read as part of this series, and, and what I really want to speak about today is just a verse in, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, which says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, but will have the light that leads to life. I get up quite early in the morning, and um, as you'll see on the screen, that there's a, a picture which shows what the kitchen looks like when I get downstairs. Now, you, you can imagine me going into that kitchen and, and stumbling my way across to the kettle and getting the kettle on and looking for a mug. It, it wouldn't be very good. But when you switch the lights on, then it makes the kitchen look completely different. And you can see exactly what you're doing. Well, the Old Testament is a little bit like that. Augustine was a, what, 4th or 5th century theologian, and he was credited with saying this, The Old Testament is like a fully furnished but darkened room. All the furniture of God's rescue is present, but it is only perceived dimly and in the shadow. The gospel turns the light on so that we say, Ah, now I see what God has been doing and how he has been doing it. As I say, in the Old Testament, the way back to God, that the salvation story has always, always been there. If we go all the way back to the third chapter in the Bible, we read about a man who would be born of the woman who would crush Satan's head. In other words, who would bring victory. The, the, the prophets had been told lots of times about Jesus and, and about the Messiah and about salvation coming. Peter in the New Testament puts it this way. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied, prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. And you can imagine those prophets writing down verses that clearly were speaking about the, the wonderful introduction of the Messiah into the world, but not fully appreciating what it was all about. And then Jesus came. And Jesus switched the light on. 
That's what we read in John chapter 8 and verse 12. I am the light of the world. Real life doesn't come from some mystical experience or some human relationship or wealth or, or purposeful career. Real life, Christianity, comes with an introduction to a person. There's a course that I know has been used many times in this church, Christianity Explored, and I've had the joy of running that course. And very often when I've introduced it to a person and they've asked, well, what's it all about? I'll say, it is simply an introduction to the person of Jesus. Christmas, as we anticipate it coming up, even though it's going to be different this year, is about Jesus, the light bursting onto the world stage. And so I want to look at three aspects of that verse in John chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't, walk, you won't have to walk in darkness, but you will have the light that leads to life. If you follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? People have all kinds of ideas about that. Well, you've got to join a church. Well, that's a good way to start. Hopefully in a church you'll be introduced to Jesus. Maybe the answer is we've got to study his teaching and, and we've got to practice them. Again, that's very important. He's given us his word, the Bible, and as we look at his Bible, we can read all about him and he introduces himself through his word, the Bible. Maybe it has to do with separating ourselves from all distractions and simply joining a commune. A little bit like a, a monk or a nun would have done maybe years ago. Well, John the Baptist is introduced to us in verses 6 to 8, that passage that Christine read to us. He was called John the Baptist because he baptized people. And he came along and, and just the very look of him didn't fit in with what people expected the Messiah to be. You see, the Jews expected the Messiah to be a powerful king, a military commander, somebody who was going to come in and, and restore their kingdom. But when John came to prepare the way, he was this wild-looking individual dressed in animal skins and his diet was made up of eating locusts and wild honey. He was sent just six months older than Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. A little bit like scientists are, are sent to prepare the way for the, for the politicians to make some kind of COVID announcement. G John came to prepare the way for Jesus. And John's message wasn't a call to arms for this great, powerful, military king commander that was coming. John's message was a plea for people to change direction. He wanted people to see how weak, undeserving, and unworthy they were. Which begs the question, how would you prepare to follow the real Jesus? Would you clean up your act? Would you maybe turn over a new leaf? Would you really make a special effort and try harder? So many people have fallen into that trap. Well, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to try harder. I need to clean up my act. One of the most wonderful things that Jesus said was this. And he said this to a, a bunch of people who were fed up with all the rules and regulations and demands that were placed upon them by the then religious leaders. Jesus came and he said to them, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that wonderful? You know, the Good Samaritan was attracted, the, the, was attracted by that Jew who'd been traveling from the road in, in, in Jerusalem down to Jericho and had been attacked by uh, these thugs. And he was attracted by his pitiful state. He was attracted by 
by his, his, his bloodied condition. Jesus was attracted to the Samaritan woman. Remember the Samaritan woman? He stopped by a well in the heat of the day and out came this woman while the, the men, the, his disciples, had gone into town to buy food. And, and out came this, this woman to get water, clearly trying to avoid anybody else. Jesus got into, con- into conversation with her and, and simply said to her, you go and get your husband. This woman said, well, I don't have a husband. I've had, was it four or five husbands? And the, the man I'm living with now isn't my husband. And of course, Jesus knew that all along. It was the fact that this woman was ashamed of the way she was that attracted Jesus to her. He was drawn by her weakness and her failure. And so Jesus comes to us and he says, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a a, a wonderful verse in the Bible which says that God demonstrates his, his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When I was... Uh, a pastor at Mickfield on my the notice board in front of me, I used to have this verse, even so the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to follow Jesus, it begins by allowing him to serve you being weighed down with a sense of your failure, of our failure and and unworthiness, is the very starting point for following Jesus. And then Jesus went on in that verse, and he said, you won't have to walk in darkness. A couple of years ago, I'm a farmer now. Well, I've always been a farmer. But I'm farming especially now. A couple of years ago, I was on the combine, and we had to do some combining at night. And, and when I switched the lights on, it was, it was hopeless. I could barely see the reel in front of me. And when my son-in-law came up with a, the tractor and trailer next to me, I couldn't see where, where the corn was going. It was useless. And so when we had the combine serviced, I said, look, we need some new lights on this. So we got some nice, bright halogen lights and uh, LED lights, I think they're called, and and it shines up all the combine table and all the field around it. Of course, I haven't had to use them this year because I didn't have to drive in the dark. But doesn't that illustrate what Jesus says? You don't have to walk in darkness. Why would you stumble about in a darkened room when you could switch the lights on? Jesus came to switch the light's on. In verse 9 of that passage that Christine read to us, we read, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And yet, so many choose to remain in darkness. A couple of verses later we read, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Which begs the question, Why? Why would anybody want to do that? There's a certain unpleasantness, isn't there, about being awoken by the light. Um, I'm a a bit of a um, a night owl. No, my wife is the night owl. I'm the one. I'm, I'm the one who gets up early in the morning. And so at night, I get to bed, 10 o'clock. My head hits the pillow, and uh, and I'm sound asleep, whereas my wife struggles to sleep. In the morning, it's a different story. And the alarm goes off at quarter to six. I'm up at six o'clock. I'll go downstairs and I'll make, a, make myself a cup of coffee and make my wife a cup of tea. Note carefully, husbands, the responsibility you have to make your wives a drink first thing in the morning. I take her a cup of tea and she doesn't, well, she likes the cup of tea, but she doesn't like the fact that I switch the lights on. It's an, unex- it, it's an unpleasant experience. We read in John chapter 3 and verse 19, the light has come into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions 
were evil. You see, when Jesus, when the light of Jesus shines on our life, it reveals what we're really like. There's, there's a, a phrase for that, and it's called conviction of sin. And it's one of the most unpleasant of human experiences. In fact, it's what makes it so hard for Christians to share the story of Jesus with other people. Because unless a person begins to see that they need Jesus and they need his forgiveness, so unless another, uh, another person sees that they're sinners, then they can never turn and know the life that Jesus brings. It is a kindness from God to show us how dark our lives are without him. I'm sure that many of you have heard of, of C.S. Lewis. He lived during the war and uh, he's very much quoted. And C.S. Lewis said this, We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Do you seriously want to continue to walk in darkness? Is it really your desire to continue to make mud pies in the slum when actually you're offered a holiday by the seaside? Do you really want to enjoy true life? Jesus' purpose is to give us a rich and satisfying life. That was his words in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He hasn't come just to give us the, the fragile tinsel of Christmas, but he's come because he is the real deal. He's come to bring light and life into our lives. In verse 12 of that passage Christine read, we read, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. That's a, a title that, that has always amazed me. The, the very fact that we, we call out Abba, Father, Paul once said in, in Romans 8, that is something we do instinctively. We call out Abba, Father. Well, we're children of God. That means that when you meet Jesus, when you trust Jesus, when you accept that he has died for your sin and you put your faith in him as the only one who can deal with that sin problem, then Jesus becomes your brother. You share in his eternal inheritance. You share in his glory. You share in his eternal home. Jesus once said to his disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you. And then he said, I will come back so that you can be where I am. It is Jesus' desire to finally come and take his children to be with him for all eternity. In fact, that has been the whole purpose for Jesus coming. In Jesus' day, the religious leaders could never know him because they were too proud to listen to him and engage with him. And yet, we read, we read that he spent time with tax collectors and sinners because he was received by them. They were willing to engage with what he had to say because they knew that they were unworthy, that they were failing, that they were sinners. And they went to Jesus because they were weighed down with burdens. And then finally, Jesus says in here, you will have the light that leads to life. I have always found immense joy in seeing people brought into Jesus' light. I, I've ran 
Christianity Explored courses and and, uh, two, three weeks ago I was speaking at a church and in the congregation was a young lady who had come to faith through one of those Christianity Explored courses. And it was wonderful to see her sitting there with her husband and to remember what she was like. In that same course was another man, a head teacher. And when he came along to that course, he came with the the desire to put this to rest once and for all and to satisfy in his mind that, that there was nothing in this whole Christian thing. That man drove home after we thought about grace. And he had to stop in a lay-by as he wept, as he realized what God had done for him in the Lord Jesus Christ. See the change in that man, and I keep in touch with him now. It's a joy. It's a delight. In a few weeks' time, I must take the funeral of a lady whose husband was converted just three weeks before he died. We prayed for him on the Sunday. On the the Monday, his wife went in to visit him in hospital and led him to the Lord Jesus. To see the change in that man for the last three weeks of his life was a delight. Jesus brings the life that leads to light. And in these verses in John chapter 1, we read about him recreating us in in a fundamental way. We read in verse 13, not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. That rebirth does two things. It removes God's punishment for our rebellion. So we no longer fear what the Bible calls his wrath. We're no longer under wrath but it also changes us so that we want to do things his way. So in verse 14, the last verse of that passage that Christine read to us, we read, and make his home among us. There's a wonderful verse later on in John, chapter 14 and verse 23, one of my favorite verses. And Jesus says, all who love me, will do what I say or will keep my command. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Isn't that precious? You see, that rebirth is so dramatic, so, so radical, so fundamental because God takes up residence in our lives. I wonder whether you feel a little bit disengaged with current thinking, a bit disappointed that life hasn't delivered, discouraged maybe, because you can't achieve your potential. And I encourage you to engage with Jesus. Like those tax and tax collectors and sinners that, that people in Jesus' day look down on and say, we want nothing to do with them. And who expected Jesus, this great teacher and miracle worker to spend time with the the religious, the better, the good people in society. Jesus went to them. Are you prepared to engage with Jesus? Because you know that you can't find life outside him. Jesus has come so that you will have light that leads to life. I can imagine now standing here in front of the congregation and uh, uh, looking out out upon you. And I've been here before and and I can imagine looking good people and, and, and many of you would say, Mark, you're preaching to the converted. We're good Christian folk. Well, praise God for that. But I want to ask you too, does the light that is Jesus truly enlighten your daily life? I grew up, and some of you may know what I'm talking about when I talk about cod liver oil. My mother used to insist on us having a dose of cod liver oil. I don't know whether it was every week or every day, but it was a a tablespoon full of cod liver oil, and we would have to take this stuff, and it was the most revolting stuff. And we used to ask, why have we got to take it? And she used to say, it's good for you. I think it's good for bones or something, maybe joints, I don't know. 
sometimes people look at Jesus a little bit like cod liver oil. He's a necessary inconvenience. A little bit like taking that cod liver oil or, or medicine that simply keeps us going. Oh yes, we need him. We need him for life, for eternal life. We need him for forgiveness. But we're not too sure about completely trusting him. We don't know if we want to submit our life completely to him. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, and we've already, I've already quoted this, we read, My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You know, Paul wrote the book of Romans. It was a letter written to the Romans, and it was basically an, ex an explanation of the gospel, of how people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he gets to chapter 12, and the first thing he says is, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Isn't that a reasonable demand? When we've considered all that we've considered, Jesus bringing life to us, undeserving sinners isn't it right then that we entrust ourselves to him and it really is okay to surrender all to jesus he is completely trustworthy and as we've read his burden is light john just described jesus as being full of unfailing love and faithfulness let me finish the last song that Debbie has chosen for us, the chorus talks about Emmanuel, God with us. And over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about Jesus coming into the world at Christmas time. And that, that's what that word Emmanuel means. God is with us. I pray that you may not only know the God to be with us in a general sense as he came in Christmas at Christmas, but you may know the presence of God in your life as an individual. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, but you will have the light that leads to life. Following Jesus begins with trusting him, for your salvation and with your life. Amen you like to just spend a few moments now quietly reflecting on what we thought about and then I'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world. It's described by you as, as a world which was dark and broken and you came to your own and, and they didn't receive you. Thank you for that wonderful promise. But to all who did receive you, those who believed in your name, you gave the right to become children of God. May we all know the joy, the richness of life as we put our trust in you and as we entrust our lives to you. For your name's sake. Amen.